We are here today with Paul Berger in the Washington, D.C. offices at Deborah Voice in Plimpton on July 16th, 2019, doing an oral history for the SEC Historical Society about Mr. Berger's long career at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. So we like to begin these interviews with a little background. Sure. And so I was wondering if you could start by telling us about where you grew up and how, where you decided to go to college. Sure. Uh, I grew up in uh, Fall River, Mass., which is about 50 miles southeast of Boston. Um, it's about a town of about 100,000 people, uh, an old textile mill town. In fact, I worked in textile mills in the summer. Um, that's all gone now. Uh, went to uh, Korea and to the south and dissipated over a while. Um, and then uh, for college, uh, I left. Um, I actually was a soccer player, got a partial scholarship to Boston University, but that was too close to home. So I decided to go to American University. Uh, went there, uh, graduated in, I think it was 72. Um, this is really stretching now for me for time. Um, after that, I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was in a PhD program for um, normative political theory decided uh, after a couple of years that um, the only thing I could do with that would be to teach, and I wasn't inclined to teach, so left that. Decided to write for a while, wrote for a while, uh, wasn't very successful. You say wrote, you mean? Writing fiction. Um, went back to my hometown, worked uh, as a production manager in a textile factory, uh, opened a little store um, selling uh, fabric stretched over frames. Uh, so I did a variety of different things, then finally decided to, uh, to go to law school, went to law school. Uh, and I am going to have to ask, sure. because it's interesting that you have a background running your own business, mm -hmm. doing a variety of things. Yep. Did you find those helpful in your career as a lawyer and especially at the SEC? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, I, I learned a lot uh, being on the business side, learning to... Uh, you know, be productive on my own, um, uh, you no know, clients, customers at best. Uh, and it was a good learning experience. Um, uh, interesting thing, uh, just a, a, an anecdote, when I was being interviewed for the associate director position by uh, Chairman Levitt, um, <coughs> he asked me the same thing about my background, and I told him, and he said, um, well, uh, I like you because uh, you didn't take a, a traditional path. And uh, if you know anything about Arthur Levitt's background, uh, he went to law school for about 10 minutes, and then he did a lot of different things before he found his uh, groove, so to speak. Uh, so I was more of the uh, unorthodox <coughs> past that, uh, that he liked. So I diverted you a little, so I yeah. cut you off when you were about to go to law school. Yes. So I went to law school. Um, I had no particular... Uh, bent at going to law school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I knew is I needed to find something to do. Um, I've always been a hard worker, so I went to law school later on. I think I started when I was 30. Um, and uh, so I worked very, very hard, uh, unlike a lot of other people, and spent most of my time either. Um, I worked when I was in law school, so I worked, went to law school. I was graduated in 80. Two, I think, uh, worked for a while for um, just a small firm, actually working on the <coughs> Gulf of Maine case. We represented uh, the government of Canada, Ministry of Justice, against the United States in the Gulf of Maine case dispute over uh, the North Sea, the uh, Georges Bank region. Okay. And uh, my job was the estoppel job, which was to determine that uh, the U.S. was uh, stopped from claiming certain parts of the uh, Georges Bank region. Uh, and my distinction there was that I, uh, one of the things I did is I went to, uh, to Maine, and I went to a library in Maine, and I discovered some very, very old maps and asked them to copy them, and they copied them. And then um, the librarian came to me and said, we have a call for you. I said, who's that from? And they said, it's the, um, I think it was the Secretary of State for the state of Maine. And they told me that I was persona non grata in Maine and that I had to leave. And 
I'm sorry, you had to leave the library? You had to leave the state? I had to leave the state. <laughs> um, and so um, I left the state, but I left with the maps. And the maps were important in the uh, International Court of Justice at The Hague in helping uh, Kendra win part of the uh, Gulf of Maine case. So how did you get from working at that firm to an interest in did you, did you at that time have any interest in securities law? I had none. In fact, I, I think I took a corporations course. I was required in, in law school, but I never took a securities course. And uh, what happened was I went to, uh, I got a job at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and I worked there for, I think it was three years. And uh, at the end of... Um, second year, I had applied for the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., um, and they didn't have an opening at that point, and so um, the chief judge at that time, Pat Wald, asked me to stay on for another year, so I did. And then actually, in maybe the third month of working in, the, in that year, it turned out they had an opening, and they asked me to, to come on, and I said I couldn't because I had already committed. Um, and that kind of foiled any opportunity to get a job there the next time. So I got a job at uh, Jenner and uh, Block um, and worked there for two years. Did not particularly like the work. Uh, did a lot of uh, transportation law, represented Amtrak, uh, uh, railroads in the Northeast Corridor, um, and was pretty much disillusioned with what I was doing. Uh, a friend of mine who had worked at the court, her husband worked at the SEC, and she, I was in contact with her, and she said, you need to speak to uh, my husband. So I spoke to him, and he was in love with the SEC, and he just uh, was enamored with the work there. So I said, well, if someone loves it that much, maybe this is interesting. So I applied, and I was accepted, and I thought, well, I'll stay there a couple of years and see what happens, and it turned into 14 years. So... What was your image of the SEC? You mentioned that your acquaintance really liked working there. What was your impression of the SEC overall when you went there in, I think, 1992? I think it was 92, right. Um, it, was, it was an interesting place. It was uh, a very collegial place, a nice place to work. Um, it was a little bit of a backwater. I remember we were on 455th Street. Uh, at that time, it was not called Penn Quarter. It was just a part of your downtown that uh, very few people went to. I remember my very first day there, I, le <coughs> I left the office at around 7.30 in the evening, and I walked outside, and it was desolate. It was like tumbleweeds blowing down the street. Um, and it was a little scary. Uh, there was just no one out there. And, uh, and I remember <coughs> a couple days later telling someone about that, and they said, well, what were you doing working until 7.30? And I said, well, that's what I did when I worked at a private firm. And that's what I think I should do now. And I kept to that routine uh, throughout my uh, career there. Um, <coughs> it was a place without technology. Um, the phone was a black dial phone, if people even remember those phones. Um, we did everything by hand. Uh, you got documents produced uh, by defense counsel. Um, you sat with a box in front of you, and you picked out each piece of paper and looked at it and wrote notes. Uh, so it was a very uh, uh, kind of old school uh, process. So there wouldn't have been electronic production in, at this time? Oh, there's definitely not electronic production, no. So what, did you join the Division of Enforcement when you entered? Yes, yes. I had interviewed there in both the um, General Counsel's Office and Enforcement. And uh, Enforcement was actually pretty interested in, in having me aboard and, and uh, they offered me a position pretty much right away, so it, it sounded interesting. It sounded exciting. What was the? You entered with a decent amount of legal experience, as opposed to other people who right. entered right after law school. So, what tasks did they give you when you joined? What matters did you start with? Well, it's interesting. You know, um, the enforcement division didn't, as a rule, hire people right out of law school. Um, most of the people that came there had about three years practice experience at firms. And in fact, when I got there, there was a committee, uh, which being one of the junior people I was put on, that uh, uh, selected and interviewed people for right out of law school. And we had a small program. It was usually, I think, in the first year, we took 10 people. 
out of law school. So <coughs> it was very small. So most people did have some experience uh, at firms or other government agencies who were kind of transferring over. Um, and you know, people uh, generally had uh, limited experience in securities law. And at that time, it was uh, kind of a backwater. You told someone you worked at the SEC, they'd say, FEC? Or, you know, where is that? And so it didn't have, at least when I was there at the beginning, didn't have that much of a reputation. And it wasn't doing a, a tremendous number of, of cases a year either. And the cases were taking an extraordinary amount of time, too. And so certainly over the course of the time that I was there, I saw a dramatic change in in both the stature and in the productivity of the uh, of the division. So, as a starting matter, what was the day-to-day -day work of an enforcement attorney if they weren't bringing that many matters, if they took a long time? So the day-to-day -day work was, and this is the, the best part of uh, enforcement, when you got there, you were given cases, or you opened cases, and they were yours, and you worked them. You ended up being on the other side of the table with people with 30 years securities experience, some of the, uh, the titans of the securities industry. You took all the testimony yourself. Maybe your branch chief was there or a high-profile case. Your assistant director was there. But you were the one responsible for putting together uh, the testimony, which is like a deposition, sure. and uh, taking all of that testimony and putting together the case, writing up all of the facts, then writing up what they called an action memo, which would be a recommendation, um, putting together uh, the, all the facts for a Wells call, things like that. So your responsibility as a staff attorney was tremendous, and it was not something that uh, you could get, frankly, at a law firm. And so one of the major attractions, I think, for people was to come to the SEC and get the kind of experience that a 10-year associate or an 8-year associate might just be getting. And that was a tremendous uh, benefit. So I think you've answered some of this. Mm -hmm. But how much supervision did you have? How much were you, uh, guidance, assistance were you able to get from either the people above mm -hmm. you or other people in the office? So the way it worked at the SEC, it pretty much was a, a strong meritocracy. Uh, I expect it still is. I hope it is. Uh, you were given uh, assignments. Here's your case. I was given two cases right away, one which had been uh, under investigation for about a year, and that person had left the commission, so I took it over, and then another one which I just opened. And in both those matters, um, uh, the branch chief kind of feels you out as to what your capabilities are. and, and how strong you are in being able to handle things by yourself. And you run things by the branch chief, and you know you draft subpoenas, you give them the subpoena to look at, you draft outlines for uh, testimony, they look at that. <coughs> and after a time, they leave you, or at least I was left by myself, and I just did the work, turned it in, and uh, moved forward. Uh, now, I, you know, I don't know if that was true for everyone, but for me, I found after a couple of months that I was pretty much on my own, and which was fine with me. Okay. So within a couple of years, you were promoted to branch chief, and then a couple of years after that to assistant director. I don't know if that was a rapid promotion within the SEC, whether that appeared to be unusual. I think at the time it was fairly rapid. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that in the 92, 94 through 6 period, it was a pretty poor um, a legal market. And so people were not moving. Um, and so there was very uh, limited mobility at the commission. And so the ability to move up to a branch chief or assistant director relied heavily on someone either leaving the commission or being promoted themselves. Um, and so there weren't that many openings. Uh, I was fortunate. Uh, there was an opening for branch chief. I got it. And uh, two years later, people suggested I apply for assistant director. And I did. And I got that. So I was very lucky. So what did you do in those <coughs> roles? So branch chief at the time, which is totally different from the way it is today, yeah. um, supervised uh, either four or six uh, staff attorneys. In my case, it was six. Um, and uh, I did what my branch chief did. I looked at the work that the person was doing. I would attend testimony with them. Almost all the time, the branch chief would attend testimony and, and very limited times participate. So I would do that. 
I would review all of the written work product, uh, edit that work product, and then pass it on to the assistant director. And as an assistant director, um, I was, and it's something I learned over time in terms of management, I was very hands-on and uh, very detail-oriented. And I would end up rewriting a lot of the action memos as an assistant director. And I learned after a while, an assistant director would supervise either two or three branch chiefs. I supervised three branch chiefs. And I learned after a while that I couldn't write the action memo for you know, uh, 18, 20 staff attorneys. And so um, I had to rely more on the, on the branch chiefs and the, and the staff attorneys. And so I would supervise all of those investigations. As an assistant director, you were also helping supervise cases that would go into litigation because the staff attorney would be, back then the staff attorneys would uh, work on litigation along with the trial unit people. So when it came to litigation then, at some point the branch chief or the, the attorney handling the matter would be paired with the trial unit? Or so the that... staff attorney, not the branch chief, would be paired with the uh, uh, trial unit person and would assist, sometimes second chair, sometimes take a, uh, a witness or two. Uh, depending on their abilities in an opening or a closing. So they would get some trial experience. And, and oftentimes when there'd be an opening in the trial unit, staff attorneys would apply for that position. Uh, and depending on how much experience they had, uh, they might get that position. It used to be when I got to the commission in 92, the, uh, a trial unit person had to have 10 years trial experience. Hmm. That dramatically decreased over time. Uh, I'm not sure why that was, but it just, it just did. Was that because, and I want to return to sort of the main, I want to ask one more question mm. following that up. Was that because trial unit was particularly desirable, or did some people just have a particular bent for litigation? Oh, I think some people just really liked the idea of litigation, and, uh, and some people were ultimately a little, little bit dismayed at uh, having transferred to trial unit. Trials are, as you know, just incredibly time-intensive, um, very stressful. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of energy uh, to, to try a case. And it, so it takes a, a certain type of person to be able to do that. Uh, and some people did it very, very well, and some people um, had a difficult time. It's not because they didn't have the talent. They had the talent, but their talent was best placed somewhere else. So why at the time do you think were there a fairly limited number of investigations taking a long time? So. The volume of investigations in the division was generally high. Okay. The number of investigations that were moving through the division uh, to completion was, was low. And uh, that, I mean, you ask 10 people what the reason for that is, and you'll get 10 answers. I mean, my view was that uh, there wasn't enough drive uh, within the division, and people needed to be pushed, and some people uh, just moved at a different pace, which is fine, but there needs to be deadlines. And part of the problem sometimes in government is there are no deadlines, except when you're in litigation and a court's setting deadlines. But if no one's telling you you need to get something done by X, then you don't get it done by X. It's part of human nature, I think. And I think what needed to happen, and certainly what I did, and perhaps people thought I was too aggressive, is I did set deadlines. That comes from my business experience, because on the business side, I had to get things done at a certain time, or business would suffer. And so when I started something, you know, I set deadlines, and I would have regular meetings. Okay, here's what we did last week. This is what we're going to do next week. This is what I expect we should get done by X date. Tell me if there's a reason we can't get it done by X date. And so things started to move, and I turned out to be a very high producer of cases. And would these either move to an action memo being sent up the ladder, or would they be cases? Would, would a, did the staff attorney or branch chief have the power to close a case by themselves? Or so what the assistant in director situation? and the associate director would determine about closing a case, whether or not to close the case. Uh, and certainly a staff attorney would participate in that decision. Um, ultimately, uh, you close, the, people didn't like to close cases. It may be true today, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure why it is. It's, first of all, there's a whole series of checklist items that you have to go through to close a case. No one wanted to do that. 
I remember when I was a staff attorney, I would come in on the weekends and I would go through boxes and everything to close cases because it was a it was kind of a dirty job and it was had to mark the boxes in a certain way, had to create uh, indexes, certain items could be um, uh, shredded, certain items uh, had to be preserved under you know government rules. Uh, so you had to go through every single document to do it. So no one wanted to close cases. So cases would stay open for a long time. That was a problem. Um, I suspect it's still a problem today. So one of the early cases you worked on, I know, and speaking of moving things quickly, was the uh, Livent matter. Right. And I gather you took an unusual, <coughs> either you or the group you were with, took an unusual approach to investigating that case. It's true. Um, this was around the time uh, Chairman Levitt was uh, was on the commission's uh, board, and uh, <coughs> we had talked about doing a case much, much faster. And so, and I had suggested, why don't we do kind of a SWAT team style, which is uh, throw a tremendous amount of resources very, very fast, uh, push defense counsel to the point that we'd say, you know, you need to produce documents by X date and there'll be no uh, extensions unless there's some extraordinary circumstance. And so we took um, <coughs> my whole branch, um, plus a couple of other attorneys, plus uh, some of the people from the, uh, uh, the accounting staff, and we threw that all in one case, which was Livent. Livent was a, a Canadian company, a theater production company, did things like Ragtime and um, Phantom of the Opera and a number of high-profile um, productions. And uh, we did, a, it was an accounting fraud case, and we did that case in a little under six months. And f from beginning to end, uh, also working with U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, uh, who ended up indicting a, a number of individuals, uh, and working with the uh, Ontario Securities Commission. And we managed to do that in a way that was <coughs> efficient, productive. Uh, we met every single morning with the entire staff, uh, discussed what had happened the day or days before, um, what was happening today, what's going to happen tomorrow, um, how are we going to move things along, what our suppositions were, what kind of evidence we had, what was admissible evidence, how could we make something admissible. Um, and so we'd have those discussions usually for an hour every single morning. And then uh, in the evening, uh, before people went home, I'd usually have a conversation with um, all the other people or senior supervisors to discuss what we had done and what our expectations were. And defense counsel were shocked and surprised and <coughs> pushed back very, very hard. And, um, but we managed to hold the line and we got the, the case done. <coughs> I presented the case to the commission uh, <coughs> with, the, excuse me, <coughs> with 102 fever, uh, <laughs> had the flu, and uh, the commission uh, was very grateful that we had moved that case as, as fast as we did. The downside, uh, the upside, obviously, is you move a case really fast. It was a high-profile case. It got a lot of publicity. I think it did a, a lot of good for the uh, commission and the staff. Uh, I remember getting uh, on my own, I got uh, hats that said SEC SWAT <laughs> um, for uh, all the staff. Um, but the downside is it's a tremendous amount of resources, time, and effort devoted to one case. And so you had to balance the, the amount of time and the resources with uh, the fact that you're taking away from other potential cases, too. So brings up a follow-up question, which is often in discussing the SEC, uh, people who've been involved in enforcement talk about the need to uh, choose a certain number of high-profile <coughs> cases to project <coughs> to let people know that the SEC and the enforcement division is on the beat. Um, was that ever in your mind with Livent, that it, or a similar case, that the case is there in part to send a larger message as well as to pursue a particular bit of wrongdoing? Yes. Uh, that is, I'm not sure how much it's on the mind of the staff attorney, but as soon as you get into uh, management and supervision, it was always on your mind. Uh, there are a limited number of uh, staff attorneys throughout the country at, at the SEC. <coughs> they, excuse me, they can't do every case that comes across their desk. And as a result, you have to pick and choose carefully. And sometimes you pick cases that don't turn out to be cases. 
but you've got to be as thoughtful as possible. And it comes down, it should come down from the top. The chairman usually has a particular um, bent or theme that they want to address during the course of their administration. And they are in close contact with their director. <coughs> Excuse me, the director in turn talks with uh, the associate directors. And they come up with ideas about where they want to go and how they want to pursue uh, particular areas. And it's all about sending messages because, y you know, one case important enough, um, significant enough, uh, cutting edge enough can send a ripple effect throughout the industry. And that can bring about changes. And I think, for example, that it did that in the accounting fraud area during a certain period of time. The Commission brought an extraordinary number of uh, accounting fraud cases. And, and I think it's had a dramatic effect, which has lasted till today. I think you see much less in terms of accounting fraud than you did back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And does that relate as well to the, to the notion that the Enforcement Division always had certain programs? At least the term is tossed around a lot, that there would be a program followed, be it accounting fraud, be it internet fraud, be it penny stocks in the early 90s, where resources would be deployed in a particular industry or in a particular area perceived mm -hmm. as problematic. It's true, and it's always been true of the division. Well before I got there, they had different units. Back in the, the uh, time of savings and loan and bank fraud, they had a, a unit for that. They had a unit for insurance uh, fraud. Um, and when I was there, we had uh, internet, microcap. Um, I was uh, co-chair of the Financial Fraud Task Force. Mm -hmm, which we'll talk about <coughs> in a few minutes. So there were um, a lot of units uh, to address a lot of problems. Uh, I think that's a good thing. I think that it creates some high-level visibility for the commission. And when you bring an important case from one of these divisions, it sends a message that we are targeting these areas. It gets people to think twice about what they might do, um, particularly if they see penalties in the area that threatens uh, ultimately you know, their financial position or economic positions. And you know, when these, some of these cases are brought parallel with the U.S. Attorney's offices, threatens their freedom. So I think things change as a result of focusing that attention. Okay. Um, that actually leads to a question you mentioned with Livent that you were cooperating with the U.S. Attorney's Office, which I was aware of. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wasn't aware of <coughs> international cooperation, for instance, with Ontario. So how, how, while you were in enforcement, did you manage cooperation with either other governmental units, most obviously the Department of Justice, or even in the Livent case in, uh, in other nations? So uh, there's, there's two areas there. One is uh, cooperation within the U.S. government, <coughs> and the other is uh, internationally. Internationally, it was always hard. We had an Office of International Affairs. I don't know if you've spoken with anyone there, but um, they worked very, very hard in order to address uh, a level of cooperation um, that certainly, when I started, wasn't there. I think it improved. Um, it probably still needs more improvement, but I think it's getting better. One of the problems was um, enforcement in the U.S. <coughs> was considered something that was expected and, and required in order to make the markets a uh, fair and, and competitive uh, marketplace. Um, that, necessar that wasn't necessarily true, uh, particularly in, in other areas of the world. And so when you started dealing with um, uh, European or Asian um, regulators, it was a difficult process. You had to be a diplomat. You had to uh, push and pull. Um, it was not easy. These were in the days, the early days, of creating a lot of the uh, uh, memoranda of understanding mm -hmm. uh, among uh, different uh, uh, countries. Um, and even when you had an MOU, uh, it was difficult sometimes to get the other country to, for example, get testimony from an individual that the Commission didn't have jurisdiction over or to get documents where we didn't have jurisdiction. And so it was a, a difficult process. It, it's a cultural issue, I think. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was because they weren't used to enforcement. They weren't used to uh, you know, regulators going into companies and companies saying, oh, sure, we'll do whatever it is you require. I know when I had a few cases, just as an anecdote, I had a defense counsel in the US call me and tell me, you know, I can't tell this person in this country to produce these documents. 
And I said, why not? And he said, because I talked to them and they just said, well, tell them to go away. <laughs> and that was their approach. And it was, it was funny and it was true from a very cultural sense that they didn't understand that there could be some sort of regulatory agency that could require, say, production of documents or talking to a regulator. Their view was, go away, we got to do our business. And so that's what we were up against. It changed over a while, and I think it dramatically uh, changed in terms of in the FCPA area, mm -hmm. a lot of cooperation and a lot of uh, uh, foreign regulators bringing cases and seeking significant penalties. But that took a lot of time. Okay. I actually want to move forward. I want to talk about the accounting matters mm -hmm. and, and the FCPA stuff because it came up in the late 90s. But let's start with the FCPA matters because I know that you worked on those matters, and actually I know you worked on those matters in private practice, which mm -hmm. maybe we can talk about towards the end of the interview. Um, it seems as though FCPA became a greater issue in the later 1990s. I don't know if that's just because more resources were directed or really, I don't know why that is. So um, it's interesting. I <coughs> took over a case from someone who moved to uh, uh, an office in, I think it was uh, Salt Lake City um, or maybe Denver. Um, and uh, it was called Triton, and it was uh, about uh, bribes being paid in Indonesia. And this was in, I think it took it over in 96. And in 97, we brought the case against Triton and a number of individuals, quite a few individuals, for uh, bribery. And that was the first FCPA case brought by the commission in 11 years. Mm. Uh, first, the last one being in 86 against Ashland Oil. And I remember bringing that to the commission, and without naming names, uh, one of the senior people of the commission said, can we bring cases for bribery? And <coughs> it was a fair question. No one had done it in 11 years. No one knew about it. And the answer, of course, was yes, there's a statute that was passed in 1977 mm -hmm. that gave jurisdiction to the SEC and the Department of Justice to bring cases for foreign bribery. And uh, I remember talking with uh, senior people at the commission at the time and said, this is something that we should focus on. There, there must be hundreds of cases like this out there, and we should start doing it. And, and I did start focusing on it. I did start looking for those cases and, and investigating and, and bringing those cases. I find that interesting because the SEC in the late 70s was so involved with, through the volunteer program with the origins of the FCPA and with disguised international bribes. It's interesting that for it appears to have gone into abeyance for what, yeah. 20 years. <coughs> Another actually interesting anecdote is that in 77 when um, uh, uh, the Congress was contemplating writing this uh, law, uh, they obviously were working with the Commission and, and Department of Justice. They asked the Commission whether or not this so-called books and records charge should be a part of the FCPA. And the answer was, no, it doesn't need to be. And Congress went ahead and wrote it into the law anyway. And it turns out that the books and records charges and the accounting charges are the most used charges by the commission throughout the last 30, 40 years now. You mean the overall <coughs> books and requirement to keep accurate books and records, not just with connection with foreign payments? That's right. So they started, the commission started using those outside of FCPA, even though they were written under the FCPA. And that is, as I said, the most used uh, provisions in the, uh, in the arsenal that the SEC has. So sort of continue with that theme, the FCPA cases are interesting because they have an international aspect. You've got to, I don't know, the degree to which you can investigate bribes that are actually being paid overseas. Mm -hmm. Do you look at the records of the U.S. company? Are you actually able to do investigations mm -hmm. of overseas activities or activities of consultants or subsidiaries mm -hmm. or what have you? So it's very interesting. Um, at first, those investigations were very, very difficult, in part because it was difficult to get the cooperation of the foreign regulator. Um, but over time, as they saw these cases being high profile, they recognized that there were certain benefits uh, for the foreign regulators as well. So we got more cooperation. Um, from a jurisdictional point of view, uh, you know, the commission took the position that uh, any transaction that occurred in dollars uh, transpired through uh, a correspondent U.S. bank, and therefore we had jurisdiction. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure about that uh, <laughs> as, a, as a legal uh, theory, but it was okay. a theory. 
uh, certainly uh, adhered to by both the Commission and the Department of Justice. And um, so you, you know, you always had jurisdiction over the U.S. company or the company operating in the, um, the, the laws of the U.S. So in that respect, uh, you could go to court and try and enforce subpoenas, and, and defense counsel knew that. And so many times they didn't push you to subpoena enforcement. They would uh, agree to production. And so you'd get certain production from their foreign subsidiaries, and that would be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, and then you'd go to the foreign regulator to see if you can get um, any uh, information from uh, the company or people who are uh, situated in the foreign country. That was less successful, mostly because the people who are getting paid are usually working in the government, <laughs> and they're not going to uh, cooperate with you. So uh, they're extraordinarily difficult cases to make, um, and, uh, and yet we still were successful in a number of uh, instances. So I know it also involves cooperation with domestic to other government, other U.S. governmental agencies, and it comes to mind because of the ABB case. Uh, and I wanted to ask, in part because that was a high-profile case, right. <coughs> but I also get, I know it was the SEC and the Department of Justice working together. Right. I think the uh, interesting thing about the ABB case is, two, one, we did work with the Department of Justice, and we started developing a relationship. Keep in mind that, you know, prior to Triton, um, the SEC hadn't been bringing uh, FCPA cases, so there was no uh, structure in place mm -hmm. to work with the Department of Justice. And then uh, post Triton and then with ABB, all of a sudden we started working with them and Justice had their, their uh, fraud division uh, and started devoting resources also to FCPA cases. And so we developed a uh, strong line of communication and uh, decided to, to work together to the extent that you could. They were parallel investigations, um, and we did that. Uh, and then there were certain issues that were presented along the way. For example, uh, <coughs> when you decide to bring cases, how do you deal with penalties? Uh, mm -hmm. And it would be unfair for both sides to penalize. Um, and in ABB, if I re recall correctly, was the first case that the Commission brought in an FCPA area seeking disgorgement. And again, uh, just as an anecdote, uh, a high-profile person at the commission said, can we get disgorgement in an FCPA case? And we made the argument that, in fact, you can and should. And that became the basis for uh, a lot of these parallel investigations of the Department of Justice. Justice would get the penalty, and the SEC would get the disgorgement. And that's how they would break it up, because otherwise you'd have these turf battles over penalties and you know there's a certain amount of publicity that is uh, accorded these cases and uh, you know both sides want some publicity and want some recognition for bringing the case maybe that's the downside of these things but that's human nature and there had to be a, a way uh, a Solomonic way I guess to, <laughs> to divvy these things up but how is how is disgorgement calculated in FCPA case I mean Something like insider trading seems fairly straightforward, but how can you figure out the, the benefit that should be returned? So that's an excellent question, and the answer is there is no science to this. Uh, it is very, very difficult, and to some extent it was rough justice. For example, in ABB, um, the staff, uh, we requested a tremendous amount of uh, information on the, uh, the profits made uh, in the pay, uh, as a result of the payments, uh, the contracts that were let. Um, and the numbers were extraordinarily high. And the question was, that we all thought about was, well, um, they actually did the work of the contract. And, s and they reaped, obviously, the reward from that. How do you correlate the, the payment to get the contract? I mean, you can take the position, and some people in the commission did, that um, you, but for the payment, you wouldn't have gotten the contract. So you pay, you got a hundred million dollar contract. You pay a hundred million dollars. Um, I didn't have that view at the time. Uh, I felt like that was excessive. That people expended a certain amount of energy in doing the work. They presented all the things that they would have to do in terms of fulfilling their obligations under a contract. Um, that's post payment. And I felt like it would be unfair, or at least for me, it was unfair to see all of that work reap zero reward. Um, and so we came up with 
a very, as I said, a very rough justice idea of what disgorgement should be. Um, I think that theory has undergone um, changes over time. And, you know, I've seen some cases come out more recently where the numbers reflect more the theory that but for the payment, uh, you wouldn't have gotten the contract. So the entire amount uh, should be, um, should be uh, given up. And, and a, I, I don't agree with that, but I think that's more where the government is now. Okay. So moving on to another big issue of the late 90s, which is accounting fraud. And I know you started the Financial Fraud Task Force. You were co co-creator right. of that. I actually want to start with Arthur Letta and talk about why, because his speech, The Numbers Game, mm -hmm. clearly made a splash in 98, but talk about how accounting fraud became a particular important issue within the commission. Was it thrust on the commission? Was it something Chairman Levitt identified as a priority? How did, mm -hmm. how did that come to be a major issue for the SEC? So Chairman Levitt definitely was uh, the, the guiding light on that. I mean, he was definitely concerned about uh, corporations and their their effort to manage earnings, which was the big issue, the numbers game. And uh, I think that he pushed very hard, and he wanted enforcement to push very hard to, to focus in that area, to find cases, um, to pursue those cases, and to investigate them vigorously. And, and we did that. And we, um, we started thinking, um, I know in Chairman Levitt's time I became associate director, we started trying to think proactively about this. We tried, this is before a lot of the technology was available mm -hmm. to, you know, to develop algorithms to look at potential patterns. And so, you know, I would take home academic articles at night and I'd read them, sometimes falling asleep reading them, um, uh, <coughs> sometimes uh, very, uh, very difficult to get through, but the, the issue for us was to try and find things in, in the literature that suggested that there were problems in the marketplace um, and try and find ways to, uh, to address that in a proactive way. You had to be careful because you don't want to open an investigation based on just a, a very flimsy theory because you're also putting a public company uh, to, uh, particularly if it gets in, uh, publicly uh, known, uh, in, a, in a difficult position. Um, it's difficult for them to defend themselves. It's also costly. It impacts the shareholder. So you had to walk a very fine line between you know, developing theories and addressing these issues in a way that was appropriate. So that leads us to the Financial Fraud Task Force. And um, as I understand, it was started about 2000. That's right. Can right. you talk a little about your role in creating the task force and what its, I mean, we sort of have an idea mm -hmm. of what its broad goals mm -hmm. were. How was a financial fraud task force supposed to accomplish those? So the task force was uh, designed, we, we decided this was really an extension of Arthur Levitt's uh, uh, numbers game and management mm -hmm. earnings, managing earnings. Uh, it, it was a way to focus, again, resources. It was an extension of SWAT team. It was a way to throw a tremendous amount of resources in a way that was uh, efficient, and so <coughs> I became the chair of that, and then Charlie Niemeyer came on, and we were co-chairs of sorry, that. I'm sorry, he was the chief. Charlie Niemeyer uh, right. was the um, chief of the uh, uh, Division of Enforcement's Accounting okay. Division. And um, so the two of us uh, ran that, and what we did is, we did a couple things. One is um, we brought together uh, a staff of uh, financial fraud um, uh, task force uh, individuals collected from the division. So it was from a branch, different branches, people would come in. Um, mostly people who had experience investigating uh, accounting fraud. And then we used, um, of Charlie's staff in accounting, I can't remember, probably 10 accountants. Okay. And <coughs> we did two things. We did uh, the investigations that were already open We'd focus resources on those investigations. We'd go through them to determine uh, the efficacy of, of those particular uh, investigations. Those that looked promising, we'd pursue quickly. Those that weren't, we'd close. And the other thing we would do is we started going through filings, um, you know, S1s, uh, 
uh, quarterlies. Uh, we tried to see if we could find patterns or disclosures that looked odd in light of past disclosures. Um, <coughs> and we opened investigations based on that. Uh, we, gave a, we tried to generate a fair amount of publicity surrounding the task force, which generated um, uh, calls to the uh, to the commission whistleblower calls whistleblower calls and um, uh, you always got a certain amount of short seller calls and you always had to be careful with short seller calls because obviously it was a self-fulfilling prophecy for them to uh, to uh, make claims about certain companies uh, <coughs> and we would vet those calls very carefully um, and that presented its own problem in and of itself but uh, that's what we did in the task force, and I think the first case we did was the Xerox case. Quick question before we get there, because I know whistleblowers became an issue by the time you've got Dodd-Frank, you've got the office of the whistleblower. <coughs> were, were whistleblowers important during your, your earlier career at the commission? No, I didn't see a lot of whistleblowers. I think part of it, there are probably a few reasons. One is that the commission's um, visibility in, in the marketplace, uh, in general marketplace, uh, was not very high. And so people didn't know. And if people were, if they were whistleblowers, I think they were more inclined to go to um, U.S. attorney's offices than they were to go to the commission. Um, and I think there was a, a fair amount of um, uh, people who would come forward in the middle of an investigation. And that's where I remember most people coming forward, you know, either I remember we had disgruntled spouses that would come <laughs> forward uh, a number of times in a couple of cases I can think of where we made the case because the spouse came forward. Um, and uh, <coughs> in the middle of an investigation, as you kind of push along and things are starting to come out, senior executives are deciding to uh, see the handwriting on the wall and deciding to come forward. So that happened a fair amount too. So I want to get to Xerox in a second, but you mentioned the attempt to give the uh, Financial Fraud Task Force a high profile, a lot of, a lot of people know what's going on. And I did notice in 2000 you gave a speech to the AICPA, uh, which is, seems designed to scare them, among other things, since one of the memorable points you made in that speech was over the last couple of years, 18 CFOs had gone to jail. Right. And I was curious about the re response you got to that particular speech. So the speech was prompted um, uh, again by um, the very senior people in the division. <coughs> that we were all concerned about getting the message out. And one of the messages was a lot of the fraud that's occurring, not all of it, but a lot of it was occurring right under the noses of accounting firms. And the concern was that the accounting firms weren't living up to their appropriate responsibilities and expectations. And so there needed to be some signal sent that it wasn't just going to be the, uh, the corporations that were going to suffer, it was going to be uh, the accountants who were going to suffer as well. And so with that in mind, um, my kind of uh, marching orders were to go out and give a speech and bang the table and bang it loud enough so that the industry would hear it. And it turned out the AICPA conference was the perfect opportunity to do that. Um, and I remember when writing it, um, uh, people had suggested, you know, you need to tell them that other people can go to jail, too, uh, because that really gets people to sit up and take notice. And in particularly in the accounting industry, which hadn't been subject to kind of the criminal um, uh, form uh, they might sit up and take notice. And so I did that, and the response um, was, was deafening. I mean, <coughs> people came forward um, and were very upset that we were taking such a, um, a dramatic uh, approach that was unnecessary, that these are people who are doing their jobs and that they weren't responsible for the accounting frauds. And our response was, how did these things happen? Some of these people were managing earnings through quarter after quarter after quarter, and no one's asking uh, any questions. Um, and we wanted to understand how that could happen uh, with accounting firms going in and auditing and doing the kind of work that they're supposed to be doing. Is that a recurrent problem? Because I know dating back to the 70s, uh, under the access theory or gatekeeper theory, there have been times when leadership of the division or leadership of the SEC has 
has really tried to tar target or threatened to target lawyers and accountants for their roles in, in accounting fraud. Yeah, and you know, over the years, uh, the commission has had its successes and losses in, in respect to that, particularly with attorneys, the bringing cases against attorneys. And um, it's o it has always been a difficult uh, process for the commission. I think the commission is generally pretty careful about making decisions uh, on uh, bringing cases against uh, professionals. Not that they're not careful in other aspects, but um, they want to make sure that they're approaching the standards correctly to, to be able to bring cases against them. It was always easy to bring cases against either a, a lawyer or an accountant who was actually involved in the fraud. I mean, that wasn't the issue. Uh, the issue was someone who is, as you said, the gatekeeper, who is sitting on the outside looking in, but has certain responsibilities as a professional. Uh, how do you treat them? And those cases required a terrific amount of additional investigation, and they were not easy cases to make. And I think the Commission over the, the span of the last 30 plus years has made a, a pretty good effort to be careful about who um, they decide to, to bring in, uh, enforcement actions against. Um, but I think the success of the Commission has been in bringing cases against accountants and accounting firms um, and sending a message that has really changed uh, the approach that uh, national offices of accounting firms have taken over the, over the last, uh, I don't know, 10, maybe more than 10 years, maybe the tw last 20 years. Is that a consequence of the late 90s prosecutions or investigations or but Sarbox also, Sarbanes-Oxley mm -hmm. also put new requirements on the accounting profession. Where, how yeah. would you, what, what would be the cause of that improvement? I think the start was, I think it's a combination of factors, and the start was the cases that were being brought. I mean, Xerox was a wake-up call yes. uh, for both the corporate world and the accounting world. And I think the accounting firms were shocked that there was a case brought against uh, accountants in the Xerox case. And Sarbax, Sarbox was actually uh, the, the I, I wouldn't say it you know, put things over the top because I think there's still issues out there in the industry, but I think it helped um, uh, provide more structure to the industry uh, by creating the PCAOB, by creating an oversight to, uh, to audits, by creating more audit standards, um, and by bringing its own enforcement uh, actions, I think uh, has had a dramatic impact. Uh, and, but I think it all started with the accounting fraud cases. Okay, so going back to Xerox, um, the firm was accused of accounting fraud at the time. In l at the time, it seemed to be an unusual case to bring, or at least a very high profile case to bring. It was clearly dwarfed by later cases. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> if you can talk about bringing the case against Xerox. So Xerox was the, as I mentioned before, the first financial fraud task force case. And so we had a tremendous amount of resources uh, devoted to that. We had, because it involved a number of different countries, we had country teams, a Mexico team, a Brazil team, I think there was a, I can't remember, a Hong Kong team or an Asian team. So there were a number of teams uh, devoted to that. It was a very large staff. Um, it a little bit cumbersome to, to supervise because uh, we use that same process of morning meetings, deciding what's been done, what are we doing today, what are we doing tomorrow, what are our expectations. There was a larger number of people involved in that um, and trying to juggle all those balls and keep things moving uh, was very difficult, but uh, we were successful at it. Um, <coughs> I think the industry both in Xerox and outside of the industry that was watching what was going on were shocked by it. Um, they thought that it was, uh, certainly at the time I think, they thought it was inappropriate and we were being overly aggressive. Why? Because uh, we were trying to penalize, in their view, a, a good corporate uh, actor. And there were and are a lot of good people at these companies and how can you go after these companies who are, um, uh, you know, hallmark names in the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's not appropriate when there are really bad actors out there. 
And our answer was, yes, there really are bad actors out there. But what we're seeing here is entirely inappropriate, and that has to be addressed. And in order for us to send the right message and pick the right cases, we need to send that you know, rock into the pond that creates the ripple effect. And this is, looks like the kind of case that we're going to do it with. And that leads up to the question of the penalty, which the $10 million penalty, while it seemed, I'll be blunt, in 2019 seems remarkably small, <laughs> uh, clearly <coughs> was, was seen as extraordinarily high at the time. So I guess my yeah. first question is, why was it seen as extraordinarily high? Just because of its unprecedented nature? I think so. I mean, <coughs> the commission simply hadn't done that in the past. And the commission had, even with the smaller penalties that it assessed, the commission had always had, and probably today still has, a debate in, in, its, uh, in its building about uh, penalties against corporations. I mean, there's one side which says penalties against corporation hurts shareholders and uh, shouldn't be, uh, should be against the individuals but not against the corporation. And the other side is um, if you expect some measure of deterrence, then you need to penalize the, uh, the corporation. And if the shareholders are upset, maybe they'll do something about it. Um, that might be a little bit naive, but it certainly was part of the theory. Um, at least the time that I was there, the, the general theory of penalizing corporation won out over the other theory. Um, and, but I think it's swung back and forth over time. Uh, the amount of money uh, at the time, $10 million, was a lot of money. Yes. And when that number was thrown out, uh, there was shock on the other side that how could you do that? And that is so far afield from where other penalties were for other companies, for much more egregious behavior, et cetera. And so that was the debate that we had with Defense Council, but we decided that um, we needed to send a message. It had to be a significant number. And as you say, in today's dollars, that doesn't sound like a lot, but back then, that was a shocking amount. Was there a debate within the commission over the appropriateness of that penalty? At first, yes. I mean, when we came up with the number, uh, I think that there were some people who said that's almost taking the defense position. That's far afield from where we've assessed penalties in the past. And shouldn't we be providing some measure of notice to the public that that's where we're going? And our response, and my response was, we have provided that notice. We have made a number of speeches. We have talked about this. We have created this task force. We have publicized it. We have said to people, this is where we're going to go. Um, and so don't be shocked if we get there. It also brings up sort of a continuing uh, issue or debate around the SEC, which is the question of regulation versus enforcement and the idea of regulation by enforcement, uh, where in some cases critics have argued that that enforcement, not even critics, mm -hmm. people have acknowledged that in some cases enforcement actions serve a regulatory function. Did that ever come up? as an issue for you? Sure, it, it, it did come up a lot. I mean, there were certainly commissioners who took the view that uh, we were taking the place of regulation and uh, we needed to damp down uh, our efforts, be less aggressive. And, and that was, I think that was a little bit politically driven, but it was a theory and it was something that we had to deal with. Um, my view was that there are regulations that the industry needs to work with the regulators on the court fin side, on the, you know, on the chief accountant's office side. Those are areas where there needs to be a good uh, working relationship. But on the enforcement side, it's very different. Our, our, uh, our mission was very different. Our mission was to protect the marketplace. And uh, where we saw problems, we felt we should address it. And the question that we always had to ask is, do we address it aggressively? or just kind of run of the mill. And um, I know my decision was, and others that I worked with, was we do this aggressively because that's the only way that we can create uh, as level a playing field as we can. And we always kept in mind the fact that if um, people didn't perceive the playing field as a level one, that eroded the trust and the confidence in the marketplace. And ultimately, while corporations might not have agreed with it at the time, um, our enforcement helped create a better working environment for 
the corporate structures. And, and I think over time, uh, as I've talked with a lot of uh, corporate people, particularly when I went to work at Deva Voice, I found that people, uh, although they didn't want to be the subject of enforcement action, no one does, but they also felt that um, uh, enforcement being where it was and being as aggressive as it was made it a little bit easier for them to operate in the marketplace. And I always felt, I don't know if they were telling me that because that's what I wanted to hear, but I always felt proud that, that we made the right decision by being aggressive and helping stabilize and make sure that people have that trust and confidence in the marketplace. Okay. So in the Xerox matter, you also brought charges against KPMG. That's right. And that also got a certain amount of attention. A terrific amount of attention. Okay. I mean, I think that the, uh, the heads of all of the, uh, the accounting firms at the time were in to speak to uh, people at the SEC, and they were concerned about where things were going. And uh, another question that arose then, uh, again, in the same context as it arose with respect to corporations, was um, <coughs> should we be bringing cases against the firm as opposed to individuals? Now, in Xerox, we brought a case against KPMG and individuals. Individual partners? Individual KPMG. partners. Yes. Um, and the partners were the, you know, the people who were responsible for the audit itself. And that created a difficult um, decision-making process, too. I mean, you know, these are, just like corporations, there are thousands of people. How can you hold um, the corporation responsible for the acts of a few people at the sure. corporation? How can you hold the accounting firm responsible for a few people? Um, and one of the things we looked at was the national office participation or lack of participation mm -hmm. in the audits. And there are procedures, uh, well-documented procedures for accounting firms uh, to review audits, including the participation of the national firm. And we looked carefully at what those the participation was and whether or not it was fair to attribute um, the, the uh, failings of the individuals to the entity itself. Ultimately, with, in Xerox, we did both with the corporation and with uh, the accounting firm. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's an issue that you have to address, I think, in each and every case. Where, at what point do you hold? I guess two questions. At what point do you decide accounting differences become mm -hmm. issues that should be dealt with by enforcement? Uh, for instance, right. when do you choose to bring a partner, mm -hmm. bring charges against a par an accounting partner yeah. for, an ac for a client's mm -hmm. accounting statements? So the answer is, I wish it was scientific, but it's not. It was, we would sit down and talk with the chief accountant in the division enforcement, and we'd talk with the chief accountant of the commission. And we would have regular conversations uh, and try and find out where they sat with respect to the conduct we were seeing and what they felt was appropriate. And again, part of the issue was, what kind of message are we sending if we're just going to bring a case against that audit partner, for example, and no one else. I mean, so the audit partner is, is a subject of enforcement investigation, perhaps can't practice or appear before the commission for a number of years or permanently. Um, is there any consequence for the firm other than the potential li liability or publicity surrounding an enforcement action where the name of the firm is out there? And we talked about that quite a bit, and I don't think there was ever any kind of resolution to that other than in an individual case, here's the message that we have to send, and the firm itself has to take some responsibility. But we did look at other things. As I said, we looked at the national office participation. Mm -hmm. We looked at the extent of the, the fraud, the, the timing of the fraud, how many years did this happen? Did it happen more than one uh, audit partner? Is it something that was just pervasive? Is no, uh, are no, uh, no people in national reviewing these things? Um, so there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of elements to a decision as to whether or not to bring a case against the firms. But there was an overriding thesis in the commission in the late 90s and early 2000s that in order to stem the tide of accounting fraud, you had to bring cases against the firms, um, the corporations and the accounting firms in order to send the right message and to get uh, a change in behavior. Okay. So moving forward a little, I wanted to ask about one more accounting matter you were involved in, which is the, uh, the case against Fannie Mae. Right. 
for accounting fraud, and that eventually settled for $400 million in 2006. So a little bit different than the $10 million. A little yeah. bit different. Was that because of the nature of Fannie Mae or just because time, there was a big difference <laughs> between 1990, between what, uh, 2000 and 2006? Both, really. I mean, uh, certainly the change in time, there have been a number of cases uh, since Xerox, which were a high number of cases, including in the mutual fund area and uh, market research area. Um, other uh, other cases uh, got a certain uh, high visibility because of the numbers. But in Fannie Mae, which was the last case I brought, in fact, I was writing the complaint at about 11 o'clock at night, the night before it came out, and I left uh, two days later. So um, that was the last thing that I did. Um, that was uh, also a function of the tremendous uh, impact that that case had in the marketplace and the message that it had to send. And we worked closely with OFEO, which was the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight. It's remarkable that I can remember that because um, memory is not that good. Uh, and we worked closely with them and their general counsel in, in bringing that case. We also worked closely with the Department of Justice on that. Um, and in fact, we had several um, high profile meetings with the Department of Justice because of the impact of suing a, uh, an agency like uh, Fannie Mae. But that was a case where it was important to, to bring uh, a case in, in the marketplace uh, to help give some sense of stability to the marketplace and confidence back to the marketplace of the actions of uh, Fannie, Fannie Mae. So I don't know if the Fannie Mae case in particular this occurred, but Fannie Mae was headed by individuals who were very politically prominent. And there was a lot of press coverage before and after the case right. about it. And I'm curious, in your position, I guess by this time you would have been deputy director. No, uh, I was associate director. Associate, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but did you perceive those political pressures? Did they ever uh, worry no. you, or did, were they communicated downwards from the commission? Um, I don't remember any political pressure. I mean, there were some cases over the years where I felt a little political pressure, but. My view was keep my head down and just do the job. And I wasn't going to be uh, uh, pushed by uh, the politics. Uh, I just felt that that was inappropriate. But uh, in that particular case, um, I know that uh, all of us at very senior levels had to get involved in order to resolve that case. Um, but I don't remember anyone pushing us politically one way or the other. Were there other matters you worked on or led while you were in the enforcement division that, that you thought either particularly important or just particularly memorable? Well, there were some cases that were memorable mostly because they were odd or from an investigative point of view. You have to remember that as an enforcement a person, it takes a certain personality to be an enforcement lawyer. Um, you have to be aggressive and you have to be someone who is willing to put themselves out there. Um, and so there are certain cases that were just plain fun to do. And I, I don't want to give that a, um, um, a pejorative connotation, but it was enjoyable to investigate and bring a case against people that we thought were bad guys. Okay. And um, I think there was uh, one case that we did, which was called Fast Trades. Um, that was a case against some Georgetown law students who were involved in a pretty outlandish uh, pump and dump scheme. And uh, so we brought a case against uh, several individuals who were, were law students. Um, brought a case against a, the chair at the time of Keithy Burrett uh, for insider trading. And he was tipping his mistress, who turned out to be a porn star. Um, and that was an interesting case. That was also prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District. Um, and so there are cases like that that were interesting. We did another case uh, against an individual, turned out to be two individuals, um, uh, called Normandy America. Normandy America was a company that had filed a registration statement mm -hmm. um, for, I, I can't remember, a $700 million offering. And it opened, and we managed to figure that one out almost instantly and um, stopped trading the day after it traded, rewound all the trades, and then, then we did the rest of the investigation and prosecuted the, uh, the individual 
and the person who was the accountant from a large accounting firm, I think it might have been Deloitte, um, who was the, uh, the audit partner, uh, and turned out to be a total fraud. The individual said that he was getting all of his trading information from this individual who had been advising him since he was 13, 14 years old, and it turned out to be a made-up person. Um, so it was interesting. It was a little bit entertaining. Um, sad because of uh, people who were impacted. I mean, this person had pulled in several very high-profile, prominent people for the board. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, I think we did the right thing. So shifting gears a little, I know you're also very involved in uh, technology issues during your time. And we earlier mentioned how when you approached, uh, or when you joined in 1992, mm. it was all paper. Yes. And uh, I wonder if you can talk a little about technological changes in the Division of Enforcement, and frankly, your perception about technological changes across the practice of law we see, or sure. you've seen. Sure, sure. So it was, um, this was the time of, uh, around the cooling of the earth uh, for <laughs> for enforcement. When I started, it was, uh, uh, as I said, the little black doll phones and no computers. Um, over time, uh, things got better. The phones improved. Uh, when I started out, it was, uh, we, I shared an office with another staff attorney, and it was enough room for two desks and probably about 40 boxes of documents piled up to the ceiling. And we just worked through boxes. Um, over time, as I rose up in management, I became the head of the uh, Enforcement Division Technology Committee, um, where we would seek funds from Congress for development of uh, different things. And from uh, data mining, which was something we pursued uh, uh, vigorously, to improving our technology, getting uh, back in those days, Blackberries for people. At first, it was just the most senior people had a Blackberry, and then it was more supervisors, and then finally um, staff attorneys. Um, to uh, by the time I left, uh, the last thing I did on the uh, technology committee was get um, every desk uh, could get uh, two uh, computer screens and either a laptop or a desktop. Um, and we had, uh, I think at the time we had case notes or case management, and you could use both screens and you could transfer one thing over to the other screen. <coughs> and so uh, we also then, d we developed uh, uh, requirements for anyone producing documents that had to be produced electronically. Um, so everything was done electronically, and so you could review everything electronically, and you could cut and paste from a document, and you could ID a document we had, uh, again, by the time I left, every document uh, c was data input so that um, it was tagged and you could search any document. And so as a result, I think investigations became much more efficient um, and I think much better. I think it became very, very difficult for defense counsel, for example, to kind of bury a document in a million, dollar, million uh, document uh, production um, because you could find it. I mean, if you came up with the right word searches, uh, you'd find the document. Is that what you meant by data mining then, the easy ease in plowing <coughs> through these once ridiculous productions? Data mining, I meant something different, which okay. was developing algorithms to, to uh, search through filings, things like that, to develop uh, ability to find patterns and instances of potential uh, corruption. Who was able, who did you, was that something an enforcement attorney did him or herself? Was that no, you specialists? No, we, we had specialists. We had a uh, section um, that uh, actually when I was an associate, I was also, <coughs> um, I was responsible for three assistant director groups, but I was also responsible for an assistant director group that was the head of um, technology. And so we had several people in that section who were um, responsible for, uh, you know, looking at different types of technology um, we had built, by the time I left, we had built a room uh, that was certified for forensics analysis. Mm -hmm. And so we could do forensics uh, uh, analysis there, uh, looking at hard drives, um, uh, recreating uh, documents that had been destroyed on a computer or deleted, uh, 
things like that, which over time I'm sure they're even better now than they were when I left. And so that became a, a real um, strong part of uh, the progress of the division, I think. And I think that has had a, a tremendous impact. I've seen that on the defense side. I've seen the improvements that they have made uh, in the way that they handle their cases, even in the way they do their uh, testimony now. They're much more efficient. Okay. So as you rose up the ranks, you clearly, or I don't actually don't know the answer to this. Would you have had more interaction with uh, the commission itself and with the commissioners as your career yes. progressed in the division enforcement? Yes. Um, when you, you know, even as a staff attorney, you will go to the table. Going to the table is when you present your recommendation for enforcement. The staff attorneys sit there at the table facing you know, the semicircle of the commissioners, and commissioners ask questions. Um, and sometimes the staff attorney will answer a question. Um, but as you rise up and become, say, an assistant director, especially an associate director, you have a much more frequent uh, communication with uh, the commissioners. And you'll go see commissioners and the commissioners' uh, councils about cases, talk to them about it, something that's going to be on the calendar, answer questions that they might have uh, prior to the commission meeting. Um, you know, commissioners would call me and say, you know, what are you doing about this particular area? You know, aren't you <coughs> addressing this? And <coughs> excuse me, you'd have to you know tell them what you were doing and uh, how you might go about addressing a particular area of interest to them. So you had much more uh, uh, interaction with commissioners as you were more senior. Okay, how did I guess we've already talked about Chair Levitt and how his priorities are communicated pretty effectively mm -hmm. to the Division of Enforcement. What about the other chairs you served under? You served under Harvey Pitt, William Donaldson. And I guess uh, Chair Cox as well. Laura Unger. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. Laura Unger as well. <coughs> how did, I'm thinking of the chair. The yeah. So well, Laura Unger was a chair. For oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. And um, Breeden, too. So how did, yeah. oh, you, you were, Breeden was still chair. Yeah. No, I served under six chairs. Okay. How did, how did, how did a chair identify and communicate uh, what priority should be? And how much did that actually change? your work, and I think you've already yeah. given us a very nice example with mm -hmm. Chair Levitt. So <coughs> I think that um, you know when a chair comes in, um, they've thought through, uh, hopefully they've thought through what their priorities are and, and how they want to pursue them. And they usually bring in their own director of division enforcement or, or promote someone whose thinking, I think, is attuned to what they want to do. And so they communicate usually with the director as to where they want to go and how they want to do it or at least where they want to go and leave how to the director of the division. And uh, I think that was generally the case with most directors, I th uh, most chair. I think that um, to a greater or lesser extent, the chairs would have ideas about enforcement, sometimes not so much. And sometimes I think that was driven more by the director of enforcement with the ideas as to what they wanted to do and made sure that that coalesced with what the chair wanted to do. So sometimes it was uh, top driven, sometimes a little bit uh, less so, sometimes driven more by the director. Okay. You served under four, well, yeah, uh, let's see, you served under four directors. Right. Uh, <coughs> Bill McLucas, Dick yep. Walker, uh, Steve Cutler. Steve Cutler, and then Linda, Linda Thompson. Thompson. And I'm curious if you uh, have any insights about how those individuals <coughs> led the division <coughs> uh, and how that changed <coughs> over time. So um, that's interesting. I mean, uh, Bill had been there, you know, in enforcement for years and years, and he kind of the natural evolution was he took over enforcement. And I don't know, you know, I got there and he was already <coughs> director, excuse me. And um, so I don't know how things changed or didn't change when I was there under him. Um, I know that I participated in a lot of meetings. All the directors would have meetings prior to the enforcement um, meetings with the commission. And so you'd go into a room and everyone would talk about the cases that they were going to present. And uh, the director would be there to ask any questions or make sure they were comfortable. <coughs> Bill had those. I think they were very kind of informal. They worked their way through. Um, then Dick Walker took over. 
uh, I think Dick had a much more of a um, marching orders from the chair at that time, from Chairman Levitt. Uh, he knew what he wanted to do in terms of accounting fraud and, and addressing those issues. Um, and so uh, there was, I think, at least from my perspective at that point in time, there was much more of a drive toward doing a particular uh, type of case and getting those cases done. Um, we also did, I think at that point in time, we were doing some microchip cases, um, microchip, micro uh, cap cases. And uh, we were also doing internet cases, which was starting to be a big thing. Um, so there was definitely a, a drive from the top from, uh, from uh, Dick Walker as to what he wants to do. And then Steve Cutler took over. And that was a natural evolution from, uh, from Dick Walker in terms of let's continue to do these types of cases. We also found um, the mutual fund market research, market timing cases. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, a, a big area for Steve to pursue. Um, and we, tr we tried to uh, devote a lot of resources to that along with the Financial Fraud Task Force. So the, <coughs> the drive for, <coughs> excuse me, for Steve at that point <coughs> was making sure that we were devoting those resources. Um, I think um, Steve brought a lot of structure uh, at that point uh, to, uh, and I was an associate director at that point, so I was seeing a lot of the structure uh, in terms of making sure cases got done and they got done on time and they were uh, you know, efficient, productive. Um, we would have a lot more status meetings with Steve about the status of our cases. And I remember going into, you know, we would have every month or so a meeting with Steve to go over our cases and I'd bring in a you know, three ring binder that was you know, eight or nine inches thick of cases. And I'd have maybe uh, 80, 90 cases and go through, in go through those cases to tell them what's the status, what are our expectations, things like that, um, and the timing of the, for those cases if we thought they were going to be cases. And so there's a lot more structure. I wasn't there that long when uh, Linda took over. Um, I expect she continued that process, but I really wasn't there that long. Um, uh, focusing that much on, uh, you know, uh, what she was doing. Okay. I realize you've mentioned a couple of points, the mutual fund and uh, uh, analyst case. Right. Did you work on either of those matters a great deal? No, no. I did. Um, I helped out on one matter, and I can't remember <laughs> what that was, but <laughs> I did help out on one thing, I think. But um, I, my focus at that point in time was financial fraud task force, and uh, we were bringing a lot of not only uh, accounting fraud cases, but accounting independence cases. Okay. Um, can you, t uh, didn't I didn't realize you worked in accounting independence cases, so let me ask just for I a brought, minute. I probably brought six or seven of them. Why did that become an issue? Um, it became an issue because we were talking with both uh, the chief accountant in, in enforcement and the chief mm -hmm. accountant, and there was a real concern that there was an issue that people were not paying attention to, which was independence. And uh, the thinking was, we really need to make a statement here. And of course, in enforcement, the way you make a statement is bring a case. Yeah. And so uh, the thinking was, let's look at these cases. Uh, whenever we're looking at a case, make sure we're looking at independence, which I don't think we really were in the past. Um, and if we have something, Let's bring it and let's make let's be aggressive and bring the case so we make a statement. So as part of an if, if an accounting fraud case came up, that would right. be an appropriate spot at which to hit independence as one of the issues. Right, right. But in any case, we, we decided that one of the standards for reviewing uh, in, in, throughout an investigation is mm -hmm. let's look at independence, see if there is an issue there. Okay. So we the histories we tend to focus on the people mm -hmm. who run the organization, right. the chair, the mm -hmm the heads of the division. Were there other people you worked with that you found especially memorable or that you think played an important role? Uh, and I, I, yeah. I feel bad about asking you to yeah. identify a particular, <coughs> two particular people. Yeah. But. Um, I mean, there were, are, I can say generally, there were a terrific number of um, really smart, talented um, people who worked in the division. Uh, contrary to the view of government employees who were just sitting there uh, biding their time. 
I found at the commission uh, people who are really dedicated to do the job. Um, you know, the division and the commission is like any other place in the marketplace. You have some good people and some not so uh, strong people. But for the most part, it was uh, a combination of collegial, talented people who really wanted to do the job and, and bring good cases. And so I, I can't think of an individual that I'd identify, but um, there are people that I worked with that uh, I thought were very strong, uh, very smart. Uh, one person, I guess, comes to mind, Richard Grime, uh, who's in private practice now. Uh, he was a terrific uh, lawyer, is a terrific lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, very, very strong, um, very talented, uh, and very dedicated. In fact, he, when I mentioned that I was there till 11 o'clock at night doing the Fannie Mae case, he was sitting right next to me <laughs> doing the Fannie Mae case. Um, and uh, so he was, he's someone who I have a tremendous amount of respect for and the work that he did. Was he in enforcement? Yes. Or, okay. Um, so between 1992 and 2006, what was the biggest change in enforcement? We might have already gone over some of this, but. So, yeah, I think between uh, 92 and 2006, the SEC became a high profile agency that brought uh, significant cases that had a tremendous impact on the marketplace. It also had a tremendous change inside the building in terms of how defense counsel approached the SEC. When I got to the SEC, and I started the first two cases that I worked on. Dealing with defense counsel was an extraordinarily difficult process. Uh, defense counsel didn't want to pay attention to you. They were difficult in producing documents. Uh, it, they just didn't feel, I think, that you had any teeth, so they weren't going to do anything. Over time, um, that changed dramatically. I think that defense counsel realized that uh, through the aggressiveness of the division of enforcement and through the cases that were being brought, that it was a better thing to cooperate, uh, not cave, not roll over, they didn't do that, but to cooperate in the course of an investigation. And uh, certainly the Seaboard um, uh, helped in, in identifying the areas of cooperation that would be beneficial to corporations, and corporations began to realize, probably through talking with their counsel, that it's better to cooperate at the end of the day than face these kinds of significant penalties and the bad publicity. And so a dramatic change occurred, I think, in the division, which is still true today, and that it is a much more productive uh, and highly successful agent, independent regulatory agency than it ever was before, certainly when I, than when I started. Okay. Well, now in 2006, you decided to go into private practice. Why? Oh, there are a lot of reasons. One is I was there 14 years. When I went to <coughs> the commission, I thought I'd stay for two years and then move on. <coughs> and, and I enjoyed it so much, I decided to stay, obviously. Um, and then after a time, uh, in the last couple of years, um, I realized uh, I was doing the same thing over and over. I mean, I was supervising you know, uh, at least 100 cases and maybe 30 cases in litigation. Um, and But I wasn't feeling like I was practicing law the way I, I wanted to. Um, and so I realized, actually, w after I left, how stale I had become. And it took me a while on the defense side to, one, to learn the defense practice, which is not something that I think, at least for me, did not come naturally, um, and to get comfortable with uh, that job, uh, <coughs> you know, you get a call from a, a client and they ask you a question and you're operating without a safety net. Um, you have to answer the question or, you know, you, you're reluctant to always say, I'll get back to you. So you, you answer the question and um, that became challenging and fun and I enjoyed that and I realized that <coughs> after a time you can become stale in one job and so, and, and also that's not who I am. I mean, I, if, telling you about my background, I did a lot of different things in my life. And I was never one to just say, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Um, I was never uh, the kid who at 16 said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do then. I mean, I went to graduate school for political theory. I mean, <laughs> who does that? And um, I, I shouldn't say that. A lot of people <laughs> do that. And, and I think that's great. But uh, 
I always was curious about doing different things, and I did different things, and so 14 years was sufficient for me. So you recently, I, I believe you're now a retired partner. I am retired, yes. So how did your uh, 13 years in the defense side, did that change your view of the SCC? Give you the different perspective you had? Um, you know, when you're a defense counsel, you're always uh, concerned that people are being too aggressive, and then you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, I was pretty aggressive. <laughs> um, and, you know, you find there are some really good people there that you're up against, and they are very thoughtful and they're careful. Uh, and I had some very strong successes uh, representing clients for the SEC, and there were other cases where at the best, I knew I was treading water, um, and the commission, I think, did the right thing. Um, so I don't know that my view has changed. I mean, you're dealing with people, and people are different, and they change, and some people that you deal with at the commission are very, very good, very strong, very talented, um, and you enjoy working with them. And there are other people, maybe not so much. I won't ask you uh, to name names. No. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to discuss? or there? Is there mm -hmm. anything else we should know about your time at the SEC that I didn't ask about? Uh, you know, no. I think we probably covered it all. Um, I suspect. Uh, I can't think of anything else that I'd uh, want to volunteer at this point. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. We well, very thank much you. appreciate it. Thank you for doing this.